Hey guys, Dr. Ken here, physical therapist. There will always be complicated ways to train and interpret nutrition and fitness, but the basic principles will always remain the same. Number one, get seven to nine hours of good quality sleep around the same time each night. If you take away all of the hacks and purely look at the research and what maintains good sleep health, a lot of the research conducted in the last decades of sleep medicine and sleep research will point to a few key things to maintain good quality sleep. Number one, keep your room as dark as possible or use a sleep mask. A good quality one will be made of silk and are surprisingly affordable on Amazon. Number two, keep your room as quiet as possible. Now, there are only so many things within our control, so if noise is a problem within your area, they do make earplugs specifically for sleeping, and I would recommend these. These are Max Ultra Soft earplugs. They're super comfortable and block out a ton of sound. Not sponsored, by the way. Number three, keep your room as cool as you can tolerate. It's hard for people to sleep in hot rooms or during the summer without AC for a reason. You see, our body temperature naturally lowers during the night and this is actually a key event in transitioning to sleep. Number four, the thresholds for healthy sleep durations keep pointing to about seven to nine hours. Any less or more tends to creep into the areas that may suggest that you would endure some adverse health problems. Finally, if there's nothing else that you could do, just go to bed about the same time each night. There's research to suggest that above anything else, consistently going to bed at the same time each night is one of the most critical factors in sleep health. Number two, eat according to your goals. So be in a calorie surplus for weight gain or muscle building, be calorie neutral for weight maintenance, and be in a calorie deficit for weight loss or fat loss. A surplus or deficit of about 500 calories is a good place to start. Now, unfortunately, there really is no way around the calorie balance problem. If you are not in a calorie deficit, you will not lose weight. If you aren't in a calorie surplus, you will not gain weight. Now, if you hate the idea of counting calories forever, here's a great tip that I read. Before you change anything about your nutrition, just track everything you eat for three days. This will give you a good idea of what you consume on a regular basis and the basic calorie count on a typical day. From there, start making the obvious changes that you know will be helpful. Whenever you feel like you're going off track or you don't remember what the exact portion sizes are, do the three day tracking again. Number three, exercise regularly three to seven times per week depending on what you're doing. Lift weights for musculoskeletal and endocrine health. There is no illusion on the importance of heavy resistance training. Almost all evidence points to its highly protective effects of the entire musculoskeletal system throughout the lifespan. Joint health will suffer if you don't perform strength training. Sarcopenia or the lack of muscle mass is a huge and underdiagnosed problem in every population, but especially the older population. Osteopenia and osteoporosis will have a greater chance of plaguing your elder years if you neglect strength training. Now the good news is that there's emerging evidence to suggest that we could slow or even reverse the progression of osteoporosis with heavy weight training in the elderly population, but more research is needed here. Beyond the obvious, Heavyweight training will have profound effects on endocrine health. Firing up the muscles can help slow and reverse metabolic syndrome, release growth hormone, improve the balance between the major sex hormones and catecholamines. The list goes on and on, and it appears that a lot of these benefits of exercise are best gained through heavyweight training. Now don't cancel me for saying this, but lifting weights is probably the most superior form of exercise out there. Walking is good for basic health. However, we cannot confuse basic fitness for training. Yes, walking is excellent for base levels of health and fitness, but it will not prepare you for more vigorous forms of physical activity unless you start adding an incline and increasing the pace that you're walking. But don't let that statement and others who bash walking discourage you from walking. Most people just need to get outside and move more. For fat loss, either brisk walking or sprint interval training is effective. When it comes to body recomposition, medium cardiovascular exercise does not exist. A vast majority of the evidence will point to the fact that long duration steady state cardio is not effective for fat loss, but the different extremes of the spectrum are. Walking for at least 20 to 30 minutes at a brisk pace, ideally on an incline, will utilize the energy systems that increase fat oxidation. On the other hand, sprint interval training and high intensity interval training are probably the most superior forms of exercise to directly address body recomposition. 
intention. And if I had to choose between the two, I would choose sprint interval training over high intensity interval training. There's exciting evidence that shows that these higher intensity regimens are highly effective, but we're just unsure of the exact mechanism of why. For pure cardiovascular health, conventional steady state cardio is good, but it hasn't been shown to be very effective for body recomposition. Don't let the fact that it doesn't help you lose weight make you lose sight of the fact that cardio will still improve your cardiovascular health and capacity. Just know which tools are best for which goals. And finally, number four, control your stress levels. So number one, meditate. Meditation has been shown time and time again to control our stress, rewire our dopamine system, improve concentration, and reduce anxiety. This can be an entire video on its own, but it's a great cost-free way to start reducing stress. Number two, get sunlight in the morning. Our bodies are naturally on a 24-hour sleep-wake cycle, and the primary mechanism that keeps us tuned to this 24-hour clock is our interaction with sunlight. In fact, getting sunlight in the morning, ideally before 9 a.m. is one of the most important things that you could do for your circadian rhythm and mental health. This is even more important in regions that don't get enough sunlight, especially during the winter months. As an added bonus, getting sunlight early in the morning will help you sleep better at night. Get outside during the morning and allow the sunlight to hit your face. You will be surprised at how much more profoundly bright it is outside than it is inside, even if you open up all of your curtains and turn on all of your lights. Yeah, this footage is so obviously during the day, I forgot to bring out my camera during the morning, so <laughs> I'm just pretending that it's morning. Number three, get therapy if you need. I cannot stress enough about the importance of getting professional help if you are suffering from some sort of mental illness. Just as you would go to a doctor for some sort of physical illness, you should be going to a doctor or some other professional for any sort of mental illness as well. There is help out there. Let's get rid of this stigma around mental health together. Number four, spend time with the people that you love doing things that you enjoy. Above any sort of intervention for a pathology, spend time with people you enjoy being around doing the things you enjoy. So those are four simple rules for you to stay healthy. Like I mentioned earlier, don't make this more complicated than it has to be. No matter what people say, the basic principles will always remain the same. Hope this was helpful. Thanks so much for watching and don't forget to subscribe.